welcome back to Road Trippy with Rachel. I'm Rachel and join me on a road trip. Today we are going to be working our way through Genesis chapter 3. So grab your Bible, grab your notebook and let's get started. Okay, so we are going to be working our way through Genesis chapter 3. So just a real quick recap of what we have done so far. We have made it through Genesis chapter one and Genesis chapter two. So we've been exploring the creation of the world and the creation of man. We saw that as we went through each of the days through Genesis chapter one, uh, we saw the grand overview of how things were created. And then in chapter two, we did a deeper dive into specifically how man was created and how God created man to be, um, to hold dominion over everything else that had been created here on earth. So now we're going to get into chapter three. And if you have grown up in church, you know that chapter three is a very important chapter because it is where we are presented with um, sin and the concept of sin and why the world is as we currently know it. So just as a reminder, as we get into this, um, these are my thoughts, my ideas, my like internal commentary as I work through a passage of scripture. Um, I do refer to outside sources and uh, I do will reference those and I will link those below. Um, but this is not like the overarching view of any particular denomination, even though I am Southern Baptist. And it's also not going to be um, the particular... Um, like hardcore theological stance on anything. This is just me like thinking my way through this and hopefully giving you some talking points, whether you agree with me or not. Um, I'm always willing to engage in conversation about some of these things. Um, but as always, and because I'm assuming most of the people who would watch this are going to be adults, um, you know, keep it candid and keep it um, polite. You know, if you want to engage in comments, I'm totally okay with that. All right, so let's go ahead and get into it. Now, I am working my, the um, the translation that I am using is the English translation, and it is a CSB Christian Standard Bible um, for the version. So we're going to go ahead and we are just going to launch into it. Uh, beginning in chapter three. Now the sermon was the most cunning of all the animals that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say... You cannot eat from any tree in the garden. The woman said to the serpent, we may eat the trees from the fruit from the trees in the garden, but about the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden, God said, you must not eat it or touch it or you will die. Now you will not. No, you will not die. The serpent said to the woman. In fact, God knows that when you eat it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God. Knowing good and evil, the woman saw that the tree was good for food and delightful to look at and that it was desirable for obtaining wisdom. So she took some of the fruit and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were open and they knew they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Now this is verses one and goes through verse seven. So we're going to tackle this part first. So let's all talk about it. We have a serpent here who apparently can speak. <laughs> Um, there are going to be various different ideas about this, whether, um, we take certain things literally, do we take things figuratively? Um, is this just a, you know, literary device that is being used in order to, you know, draw the hearer in when this would have originally been shared? There's a whole lot of discussion going there, but let's just go ahead and stick to the facts that we know. We know that God created everything. He spoke everything into existence with the exception of mankind and that he said that it was very good. So we know that for better or worse, originally the serpent was a good thing. Um, now the serpent was the most cunning of all the wild animals. So when we hear cunning, um, it normally has a very negative connotation to it. So I looked it up in the good old Merriam-Webster and cunning means having or showing skill and achieving one's end by deceit or evasion. So like I said, we knew that all creatures were good whenever God created them. So there is something that is going on with this particular serpent. Now um, we can take a look at it and we could argue that it is um, perhaps the certain, the serpent 
was possessed. I mean, that's possible. Um, perhaps the serpent, what really was this intelligent and animals could talk, you know, I mean, it's possible. Uh, perhaps this was, um, I don't know. Like, I don't, and I don't think there actually is an answer to it. But what we do know is that when God created everything, that it was good. And that at the end of creation, God said that everything was very good. And that um, whatever is happening here, this is happening for a reason. And that it is told in a specific reason. And it doesn't change the fact of what the outcome of this ends up being. At the end of the day, we know man sinned, <laughs> mankind sinned. And that there was a punishment that that happens because of it. Um, we could get lost in the details. And I think there is a place for us to get to, to uh, tackle this and to go into it um, because we care about God's word and we care that we know and that we understand it. Um, but for our purposes today, I think that is a much deeper discussion than what I'm personally in a position to like have a discussion with. And I would need to consult a lot more books than what I currently have available to me. So, we know um, that at some point in time, the serpent became very cunning um, and that he was apparently able to speak and that he went for the woman and asked a question. Did God really say you cannot eat from any tree in the garden? Now, let's just stop and let's consider this here. We're still in verse one. So one it's talking and it went after the woman. Now there are a whole lot of questions as to why did he go for the woman of, you know, he had two choices. It was a 50, 50. Like, are we going to go for the guy? Are we going to go for the girl? He chose to go for the girl. Um, one of the books that I've really been referring to throughout the study of Genesis has been Dennis Prager and the rational Bible. And it's specifically taking a look at Genesis and the use of like, and the, the understanding of Torah, which is, um, the Jewish word for the first five books, what Christians would refer to as the Pentateuch. Um, and then we're specifically looking at Genesis here. But so it brings the question, did the serpent go after the woman because he thought she would be easier to deceive? Looking at it, I, I understand why, especially like if you consider like the traditional Christian view of like this whole scenario that is playing out um uh especially like when we consider like the whole like european view of it so did this did the serpent go after the woman because she was going to be the easier to deceive and that he thought he maybe he was going to have to work a little harder with adam it's possible prager um brings that up that that was something that could possibly have happened um in reality like i think the i think the Serpent really had to work kind of hard, actually, to get the woman to believe him because they had to engage in this question and answer. And we see later on, you know, like he had to he had to persuade eat the woman to eat the fruit. Um, the man just took it <laughs> like there's nothing recorded in scripture that like there was any question, like there was no discussion. It was like, yo, babe, eat this. And it, apparently he did. Like we, we don't see what the discussion was. We don't know if there was a discussion. We can only go based on what um, scripture says, but the serpent does something here that is um, very true within the art of persuasion. And that is that he begins with a question. So any, t if you're wanting to convince someone of something, you lay out the argument and you get them to defend it, but you tweak it in such a way that you can, confuse them without them actually realizing it. So here we see the serpent says, did God really say you can't eat from any tree in the garden? So there that use of the word any, he, he first asks, did God like restrict you from eating from any tree? And we, we know that if we were to go back to chapter two and to chapter one, we see that no, God said you can eat, you can eat from any tree except this one. So the prohibition only accounted for one very sp particular tree. The serpent is saying, oh, any tree. So the, he stretches the prohibition out to all the trees. So, and of course, the woman is going to respond back. 
The woman said to the serpent, we may eat from the trees in the garden. True. Absolutely. Uh, but about the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden, God said, you must not eat or touch it or you will die. Now the or touch it is where we run into problems because this is where this was added. This was not a directive from God. He said, you may not eat of it. There was nothing about touching it. If man was meant to care for the garden at some point, that means he was going to have to go and take care of the tree, which would probably mean like he had to prune it or maybe he watered it. He would probably do something that would help it continue to grow and remain healthy. I'm just saying, I'm not a gardener. I just assume that's some of the stuff that you would have to do. So touching it could not have been a prohibition that was placed on them by God. But the woman says that it is. Now, this is where we run into danger. You should never add, nor should you ever take away from anything that scripture says. Um, over and over, we see throughout the whole of scripture that that's a very bad thing. And it only ever leads to trouble when you try to put words in the mouth of God. Here, Eve does that. So big mistake on Eve's part. Now, there have been questions out there. You know, Eve was not given the directive, do not eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil herself. This was a directive that was given to the man. And did the man actually communicate it to his wife? You know, did he maybe add something with good intentions to make sure that she never came anywhere near it so that this whole scenario wouldn't happen? Who knows? That's all like a guess and it's a shot in the dark. It's a what if, um, but we can't run life on what if. And the reality is, is that we, we are in reality right now um, and that we live with the consequences of sin. So no matter what happened at the end of the day, someone ate the fruit. <laughs> that's, that's what this ultimately comes down to. No, the serpent says, you will not die. He says this back to the woman. So now we've entered into an argument. So he asks a question and calls God in. Uh, he's asking for justification of what God says, even though he deliberately skewed it. The woman answers back, gets a detail wrong that then allows for an opening for the serpent to come back saying, no, you will not die. So he's contradicting God and he is focusing in on a very specific point. And it was a point that he initially made. And even though the woman carried it farther, um, the serpent hones in on a very specific point. It's all about like eating it. So in fact, God knows that when you eat, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So here we have what if if we were to follow the like traditional Christian viewing of this, we believe that the spirit, the serpent would have been um, is either a, a representation of Satan or like Satan was possessing the serpent. Either either one. We know that this guy's bad. We just can't view this as an allegory of good and evil because um, God did not create anything that was bad. Satan, the devil chose to go against God. That's a point. Um, it, that's understood. So remember, I'm going to be approaching it from that. Um, so as we're continuing, he's caught the serpent is now calling into question like God's integrity, that what God is actually doing from the serpent's viewpoint is it's not that God wants to protect you. Like it's not that you're going to die. It's that I don't want you man, woman, to become like me. Because if you become like me, that means I'm not the person in charge anymore. It means that you become my equals. This is what the, in my opinion, the heart of sin is, is whenever we want to replace God Almighty, the creator, the Elohim, the El Shaddai, the, the creator God, the Adonai, when we, the Yahweh, when we want to replace that and put ourselves on that throne. In my opinion, making ourselves out to be God is probably the greatest sin that there is. And ultimately, that is the sin that we we commit on a regular basis. It's when I say, I want to do it my way instead of doing it God's way. So anyway, slight rabbit trail there, um, slight tangent. But this is exactly what the serpent is doing. You're going to that if you eat it, you're going to become like God. And he doesn't want that. 
So he's making God out now to be the bad guy, even though we know that God is the good guy. Like there's not even like a decision over who's good, who's bad, like because God and the devil aren't even equal. Like God is the creator. It's the creation now is calling into question what the creator did, which they have no right to do. So and then the whole idea of knowing good and evil. Adam and Eve at this point are completely innocent. Um, there, there's no um, perversion in them. Um, now we tend to think of perversion in like a sexual sense, but perversion really means like, like anything that is twisted from what it originally was intended to be. So this, this doesn't exist at this point. There is no like questioning of who God is at this point. There's no, um, everything is exactly the way it was created to be with the exception of the serpent at this point. Um, and that is because someone has interfered with it. Although nothing is a surprise for God. He knows everything that's going to happen. He knows everything that will be. But we see here that the idea of knowing good and evil is not just like this is good and this is bad. It is that man would now know, they would now recognize what is evil. They will now see the world through a perverted sense. Um, it's not going to be that innocent world of like of like this is the beauty that God has created the way everything was intended to be they're going to see now everything through a skewed view now they don't understand that's what the serpent is saying saying but the serpent understands that's exactly what he's saying he the serpent uh misery loves company so the serpent doesn't want everyone to be all innocent that he wants an entire group of people to be rising up against God trying to make themselves God and wanting to take over so then we come back to the woman in verse six. The woman saw that the tree was good for food and delightful to look at. True. This isn't wrong. Um, you know, God said like everything was beautiful and that everything looked good. Just don't touch this one tree or not touch. That's me. Don't, don't even come near it. Don't eat it. Uh, you know, you can eat from anything. Just don't eat this one. So it was delightful to look at, completely true, and that it was desirable for obtaining wisdom. Here's where she's now added in. She's bought into the lie that the serpent is telling her. It's desirable for wisdom. She, she gets what it is, and she's like, I want some of that for myself. So she moves on that. So she took some of its fruit and ate it. So congratulations, woman. Um, you made up your mind and you went for it um, as a good, I suppose, a good feminist is going to stand there and say, yes, you went for it. Um, and uh, you do have to admire her. She didn't hand it off to someone else to test out and find out are they actually going to die. She at least had the, the nerve to do it herself. She ate it to find out if she was going to survive. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Now, um, I feel that we can't move really forward without addressing the elephant that is in the room proverbially. And that is that either the woman had this conversation with the serpent and the man was nowhere around her and therefore was not able to interfere and be a good man and take care of his wife. Or the man was there for this entire exchange and did not step up to the plate and do what he was supposed to do, which was, take care of his wife and guide her in this particular issue. Um, very obviously the man did not interfere no matter what happened. Um, whatever scenario we want to come up with, whatever scenario we want to think of, um, the man did not interfere. And in fact, he, there is no argument. Uh, <laughs> there's no comments. There's no argument here. Um, he's just silent the entire time. <laughs> like there's nothing there. And he just takes it and eats it. Woman's like, yo, babe, here's this, this fruit. I don't know what kind of fruit it is, but here's this fruit. Some serpent told me it would be really yummy and that we, we look, I didn't die after I ate it. And then he eats it. So, I mean, if you're going to get mad at anybody, <laughs> let's just get mad at the man. Um, in this case, he did not stand up. For his wife. I mean, and I don't think anyone could like come back and say that that's wrong. He did it. The eyes of both were opened 
and they knew they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Now, um, as I was reading through Prager, because it's the view of, like I said, it's the view of Torah. Um, Torah seems, at least from Prager's description, it seems as though Torah sees this as being more of like a sexual awakening. Um, the idea that they understood procreation and that the fact that like two people came together, but now it was um, sexual awareness. And um, I personally don't agree with that. Um, I think that God created intimacy and that it was, it's supposed to be good. Now I am not married. I don't have any children. Um, so I have never experienced this, but to me, that doesn't sound like it would really, that, that's an argument that would hold water. Um, just because Adam and Eve would have been aware of each other and God gave them the commandment that they were supposed to be fruitful and multiply, which means that they would have already have been sexually awakened in this case. Um, so they were already aware of each other. They knew how the, all the mechanics worked and that it was meant to be a beautiful gift that God gave to people. In my opinion, they, when it talks about, and they knew that they were naked, I think this is where we see shame for the first time. Because here it is not so much that they are aware of each other's bodies, but that they're aware of their own. And the human body was the only creation that God got down in the, the mud and the muck and he, he, he made them. He didn't speak mankind into existence. He made them. Um, we talked last time about that there are different words that were used whenever it comes to mankind. And they, in my opinion, I think they were, they realized that, or at least they were under the impression now that their bodies were flawed because, you know, what's, what's the big thing that we teach our kids? Like you don't let people touch you or you don't want to be touched. Um, you don't have to let people touch you when you don't want to be touched and you should hide your body. Not, and I'm not talking like in like a negative, like I'm not talking like, modesty, purity, culture. I'm just in general talking about like, you don't see people walking around like naked as a jaybird. You just don't um, because it is considered inappropriate. And um, what's the big thing that a lot of like teenage girls and guys really struggle with whenever they get into middle school is that you have to dress out for gym. I don't know if they still do that. I had to dress out for gym. Um, people don't want to show their bodies off in that way. And the people who do, um, you know, that that's, that's a totally different. Those are like adults, adults who have become more comfortable with who they are and like who they are physically, they're comfortable in their body, they're comfortable in their skin, but in general, majority of people are not like that. Now that's not a commentary to get involved in any of the body positivity movement. Like we're not going there with this. Um, but this is, this is just my thought on it, that they became aware of their bodies and for the first time they saw flaws in themselves and that they experienced shame. They experienced embarrassment and they experienced um, not wanting the person who should be able to see them to see them. That's my, that's the commentary of just Rachel. That's not like in any of the books that I've been looking at this, this is just like my thoughts completely on that particular issue. Um, do with it what you will. I think it would be a good discussion um, to have if you're in a small group or to um, even like sit down in a Sunday school class. Um, I would say probably more in, um, I would not have that discussion in mixed company though. I think that would be better to have, like, if you're in an all women's or an all men's group. Um, my opinion, do with it what you will. Okay, so we're going to move on to verse 8. Now, in my Bible, it says that this is the, like, heading is sin's consequences. So we're going to go ahead. We're going to take a look at this. 
Um, then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden. So that would have been something so beautiful. Like we can't stand to be in the presence of holy because sin cannot be in God's presence. And up until this point, like they were able to be there and now they can't, which is so sad. That's how quickly sin hit them. Um, walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. So the Lord God called out to the man and said to him, where are you? And he said, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid. Then he said, who told you that you were naked? Did you eat from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? Okay. I'm going to stop here just momentarily. That's the end of verse 11. <laughs> You know, when you are with a kid <laughs> and they do something you told them not to do, but you ask them about it anyway, because you're giving them the opportunity to come clean. <laughs> That's exactly what I think of every time I read this, uh, especially since I reached adulthood. And like now that I have experience like working with children, uh, <laughs> that's what it really feels like is that God's talking to some children. And it's like, where are you? Because God knows exactly where they're at. He knows everything that happened. Like, he deliberately walked through the garden at this time after all this happened because he went to, like, try, like, not to try because God doesn't try. He does. But he went to solve the issue. <laughs> and here, here they are. We're hiding because we realize we're naked. And we don't want you to see us, which is another, like, if you want to go take, um, the stance of this being an allegory, perfect thing there. We try to hide our sin from God, but God knows everything. And we try to hide our sin from others and we try to cover it up with whatever we can. Um, but God's like, did you eat from the tree? I told you not to like it. There's not even a discussion that happens here. It's immediately like, did you do this thing? Like it's the one thing you weren't supposed to do. Did you do it? Kind of like, did you touch the base? I did that when I was little. I touched the base. My mom told me not to. And like it broke. And I was like, I don't know what happened, mom. <laughs> That's exactly where we're at right now. My mom knew exactly what had happened. God knows exactly what happened. Um, so I just made a note that um, Adam and Eve, they're, they're stating like they're naked and they're ashamed. Um the human body is God's creation and the only one that God made or formed and didn't speak into being. And they're hiding it. They're hiding. The creation is trying to hide itself from the creator. It sounds so silly because it is. Um, the pot doesn't try to hide itself from the potter. You know, the, the, the bench doesn't try to hide from the carpenter. Like We can't hide from our creator. We just can't. It, it, it does not compute. Um, then he asked, who told you that you were naked? Did you eat from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? God already knew. He already knew, and he was just calling them to the carpet to, to have the conversation with them is what it comes down to. Like, he did what a good parent does, and he he calls them. He's like, you did this. I, I might be phrasing this as a question, but I already know what the answer is, and I just want you to affirm it. But then we get into something else when we get into verse 12. And you can see just how rapidly sin is taking over. Like, what was something so beautiful? The man replied, the woman that you gave me, gave to be with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate. So now the blame game has started. And it's not just like, oh, the man is blaming the woman. He's like, the woman you gave me. I'm naked. I'm ashamed because of you, God, because you made the woman and the woman ate the fruit and then she gave it to me, which I ate. So therefore, if you hadn't made her, she wouldn't have eaten the fruit. She wouldn't have given it to me. So therefore, this is your, your fault. So the Lord asked the woman, what is this you've done? 
because once and again, God already knows. He knows this is what happened. And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. She admits it. Yes, I ate the fruit. The serpent deceived me. So she's not turning around saying the serpent you made. So you got to give her at least a little bit of credit here. You know, she didn't test this out on her husband first. And she doesn't turn around and blame God for what happened. She's like, yep, I ate it. Serpent deceived me. So she was aware that she was deceived. And I kind of wonder, and once again, Rachel's musings. I kind of wonder after they ate, because there was this whole conversation going on between even uh, between the woman and the serpent. After she ate, did she realize immediately like what had happened? That she was deceived. Because here she recognizes it. I was deceived by the serpent. And I ate. So she is recognizing that there was something that she did. But now we get into the... Um, now we get into like the real consequences of it. And God directs statements at each different person, each member of this little triad that formed who was involved in this. So we start this in verse 14 of chapter three. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, you are cursed more than any livestock and more than any wild animal. You will move on your belly and eat dust all the days of your life. I will put hostility between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He will strike your head and you will strike his heel. So we're going to get into this just a little bit. And one of the things that I really did, I hadn't ever like thought about, but Prager makes this good point that this is how Torah like views this particular like section, um, these couple of verses. And that is that God de deifies the serpent. And if we go back and we look at culture, um, some of the darkest cults and some of the, um, some of the, the ancient cultures that did things like human sacrifice, who did things that were what we would just consider absolutely deplorable and heinous often had a deity that took the form of like a snake. I hadn't ever like actually computed that before because you just get used to like, oh, you know, cult, ancient cultures, they worshiped, you know, nature and like you accept it and you just move on. It's all ancient history, yada, yada, yada. I hadn't really thought about that until I read that and I was like, you know, they're right. <laughs> that the, the snakes had often been held up and um, when I was flipping through, hold on, let me find the verse. Um, I've got the prayers book over here. Um, let me just read you the section that is out of verse four. It's three fourteen, and it's the like the ending one. It says, um, among other things, God cur God's curse. So He did curse the serpent. D de deified the serpent which was worshipped in many pagan societies, including the Egyptians, Sumeritans, Hittite, and Canaanite. Throughout the Torah, the Torah seeks to undermine polytheism by dethroning the gods of the ancient world. Thus, for example, nine of the ten plagues of the Exodus were directed against Egyptian gods. Makes sense. That in that if you're we're going to compare like all these other ancient cultures and then look at um, ancient Hebrew culture, the snake has no place in it. The serpent has no place here. So something else to think about. I think it would be worth a discussion in your small group. And you will eat the dust all the days of your life. And I will put hostility between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He will strike your head and you will strike his heel. Now, I think in this section, like we see it, that it is a prophecy of, that Christ is going to come, that the serpent is going to attempt to go for the feet of someone. But at the same time, that um, that offspring, that seed, um, that he that is to come is going to crush the head of the serpent. It's going to crush the head of the great serpent. Um, now, I will put hostility between you and the woman. 
I think on here, like if you really wanted to, you could take an allegorical approach to this particular statement or actually take it literary, literary, literally. Um, in the allegorical sense, like we see it as, um, which is where we add, um, there is spiritual sim symbolism here. Like, yes, we definitely see this, that this is a prophecy, that there is and always will be um, Satan is attempting to place himself on the throne that only belongs to God and therefore only belongs to Christ. And we see that later on when we get into the Gospels, which we'll tackle at some point here down the road. Um, we see this, that there is animosity always between them. And we know that because Jesus is God, that it's, it's, it's this little yappy dog trying to take on this big wolf. The yappy dog is never going to beat the wolf. And we all know that in this case, the snake is never going to beat the lion of the tribe of Judah. <laughs> we all know that the snake knows that it's not going to happen. And that will preach. If we want to take it literally, I hate snakes. I'm a lady. My mother, my mother's a lady. My sister's a lady. We all hate snakes. If we want to take this literally, I think you're weird. I'm sorry. If there is a woman out there who is watching this and you just talk about how much you love snakes and that you have pet snakes, I'm sorry. I am judging you. <laughs> I think you're weird. I just do. I don't understand why you would ever like a snake. In my mind, even though there are snakes that do good, like they eat um, frogs and they eat mice and they eat rats and they like help control different populations. I'm sorry. I hate snakes. I flatly hate, hate them. I don't care if they're poisonous. I don't care if they're good for the environment. I, like, I don't understand how Mrs. Noah left them on the boat. I just don't get it. I hate them. I've said it. I hate them. The only good snake is a band that goes on my cowboy hat. That's all I can say about this. If we want to take this literally, that's how I feel about it. I'm going to move on now. Okay, so that was the that was how the serpent in and of itself is cursed. Now we're going to move on to the woman. So he picks this up now in verse 16. He said to the woman, I will intensify your labor pains. You will bear children with painful effort. Your desire will be for your husband, yet he will rule over you. Now, I think we can break this up and um, and look at this piece by piece. I also think that here there is a lot of room for a lot of arguments to happen. Um, now, there are some people who are going to take this as a egalitarian um, stance, which would mean... Um, for the sake of this argument, I'm going to say they're talking more of like feminism, which um, they're like, I can go on a whole discussion about that. Um, there are places where a little bit of feminism isn't necessarily a bad thing. Um, you know, I believe in equal uh, pay for equal work. That's a very feminist concept. Um, I also believe that I have the right to wear pants. So <laughs> even though I like skirts and dresses and actually prefer them and wear them, primarily to my job. Um, I think this opens up a lot of room for a lot of discussion here. So I'm going to do my very best to, to look at it individually um, and just give more of like a running commentary. That doesn't mean that any of it's correct. It doesn't mean it's wrong either. It's just a running commentary um, of kind of like, as I'm reading through this one um, women are not cursed. If you, you will see the, Serpent itself is cursed. The woman is not cursed. He said to the woman, I will intensify your labor pains. So for it to intensify, that means that there was already going to be labor pains, which honestly like makes sense. I don't know why anyone would really think that like giving birth would be easy. I think it just got worse. Um, because even though there wasn't like there wasn't death, there was still would there would have to be a certain amount of pain because the human body is pushing another human being out. Like I said, I don't have children, so like I can't fully empathize with this, but I would imagine like 
even like if you're given an epidural, like you still feel something. Um, like no woman feels absolutely nothing. And if for some reason she doesn't, there are greater issues that are involved here. Um, and you'll bear children are painful effort. So it's going to hurt. And it's going to hurt a whole lot more than it was originally intended to. Um, your desire will be for your husband, yet he will rule over you. This is really where I think like the, you can go in a whole lot of different directions here. And I've heard a whole lot of different understandings. Um, your desire will be for your husband. You got, so you have one camp that is probably going to say that women want to dominate and rule over their husband. Like women want to be in charge. I've heard that argument. Um, I've heard the argument that this is, um, that we're talking once again, like sexual desire here. I've heard that argument. Um, I've also heard the argument that it is women want to be loved and desired. Your desire, they're talk they are still talking sexual desire, but they're saying it will be for your husband that you want to be loved and you want to be cherished and you want to, uh, um, that you want your spouse. Um, to look at you and see you and to want to be partners with you. Uh, but he will rule over you. So here, like you see, like um, you can have that there will be men who will be abusive. I've heard that one, that there is going to be like um, the man is going to be the head of the household um, in a domineering way. Um, I've heard that he's going to not love women the way that they're supposed he should be the way he was created to be there's just there's a whole lot of different camps that exist and that w could be argued from this verse i'm not going to go into it because i don't know what the answer is um and there's so many different viewpoints on here i think it's worth discussing but once again i think that's a discussion that needs to take place like in a group and depending on how your church is arranged or how your Bible studies arranged. I think you should probably like do it maybe in like, you know, like a group of all women or a group of all men and have that discussion. Um, because depending on how you come out will really depend on how you're going to approach your spouse or like a lot, like, like it's a very loaded section. Okay. And he said to the man, <laughs> let's go back to the man. Uh, because you listened to your wife and ate from the tree from which I commanded you, do not eat from it. The ground is cursed because of you. So man is not cursed. The ground is cursed. You will eat from it by means of painful labor. So because the ground's cursed, <laughs> boy, it's your problem now. Um, you're going to, you want to eat? I had you. Like it, you could plant it and it would just grow. Now you're going to have to work for it. Um, it will produce thorns and thistles and you will eat the plants of the field. You will eat bread by the sweat of your brow until you return to the ground. So the human body is going to deteriorate. The human body will rot and there is going to be physical death. Previous to this, we did not see where that was going to be an issue. And as we, I recently heard, like was in a discussion with someone. And one of the things that, that was brought up is that once we make it past Adam, we see the steady decline of how the human body, which Adam would and um, his wife were perfection, you know, like the healthiest, like there were no bad genes. <laughs> there were no bad genes. Like there wasn't going to be arthritis and heart problems and like dementia and Alzheimer's. Like there wasn't going to be any of these problems. Cancer wasn't going to be a thing. Um, but you see where people's lifespans got shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter, um, as they go on. Um, interesting thought though, that, and I, I would probably roll with that one. Um, for you are dust and you will return to dust. So man's man was created to work. Well, now you're going to have to work hard. Um, the man named his wife Eve because she was the mother of all the living. I've, I recently heard someone make this statement and I thought it was fascinating because I've never picked up on it before, but it wasn't until after sin enters the world that the man gives his wife a name, which shows that he held dominion over her. Um, Cause he named all the animals and he didn't name his wife up until after sin enters the world. And after we have this whole scenario take place, I think it's an interesting, um, 
it's an interesting view. I think it's worth discussing. Um, the person I heard make that statement um, is a graduate of a seminary. And when I heard her talk about that, I was like, you know, I've never thought about that. And I had to let that percolate for a little while. But if you think about it, we always talk about Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve. But we never think about like, when did he actually name her? And he named her after sin enters the world. And that is... It's just, it's just interesting because if if we take the stance that he he named her and it was a show of dominion over her, then it is a an immediate fulfillment of what God says to the woman that he he's going to rule over her, that her husband would rule over her. It's an interesting thought. I'll leave it there. Once again, great discussion for your small group. The Lord said. Uh, then the Lord made clothing from skin for the man and for his wife and he clothed them. So the first actual death, like physical death that takes place in the garden is administered by God. I wonder what that critter was um, because they obviously don't exist anymore. Uh, the Lord God said, since the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. So they're talking about like, it's, it's like God having a discussion with himself. Um, you know how like, I tend to do that. I'm an audio processor, although God doesn't need to audio process. He can just have the conversation with himself. Um, knowing good and evil, he will not, he must not reach out, take from the tree of life, eat and live forever. There was a lot of bad that could happen. Um, not that it was a fulfillment of what the serpent was trying to make Eve believe, but because now you would have, um, people who were dying to sin and, would then live forever. That would be, that would be painful. Cause there is relief for, with death. Um, we get to go home and we get to be in heaven when you're a believer. It would be very difficult to be in a constant state of your body dying and then continuing to live on. Okay. So the Lord God sent him away from the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove the man out and stationed the cherubim and the flaming swirling sword east of the garden of Eden to guard the way to the tree of life. So not only do these people lose their innocence, where they are now ashamed of what God has created, and they feel shame for the and embarrassment, and um, they are now suffering under the the curse that God has placed on mankind in general, um, because they know now good and evil, which means it's been twisted and it's been perverted, and they're ashamed of their bodies, and they have now experienced death because God killed something um, in order to clothe them, um, and. Eve is now going to be in great pain in order to bring man into the world and to bring other people into the world. And Adam is going to have to work much harder than he did previously. Now they're kicked out of their home because the consequences could be so much worse if God allowed other things to happen. And nothing happens without God knowing about it. Nothing happens that is outside of his plan. But it could have been a lot worse. And in God's grace and mercy, he keeps them from being able to live forever. But the consequences of that is that they can't be in the beautiful um, utopia that God created for them to dwell in and for them to be with, with all the animals. And it wasn't just the consequences of that Adam and Eve weren't the only people who had to live with the consequences. Now, like all of creation has to live with the consequences of their actions. And like I said, um, this could very easily turn into the blame game. Like you can go in all different directions with this, but at the end of the day, when we wake up in the morning, we know that we do things that are wrong we know that we do things that go against 
what God wants. We know that we don't always treat people right. We know that sometimes we say, think, or do things that are wrong. We know that we are all sinners. And that is a fact that we have to live with. And we can always have different arguments about various different things whenever it comes to creation and how we got sin. And do we think people can be born um, without it? Do we think you can ever live a perfect life without sin? Um, There are plenty of other arguments that are out there, but we can't change the reality of what we live in. And the reality that we live in is that sin exists and that it is because of Grandpa Adam and Grandma Eve. Um, That's just the way it is. So, like I said, I would say go on ahead. I think I brought up a few points that would be worth having a discussion in your small groups or your Sunday school classes if you're working through um, Genesis. And just as a final reminder, like none of this is like a running commentary of um, any like a like denomination. I do this completely on my own um, for enjoyment because I like teaching and thinking and getting ideas out there that I think could possibly align with scripture and that aren't theologically like going completely off the road. Um, I think like having discussion is always good and it's always healthy. And I just want to give people an opportunity to be exposed to biblical knowledge and to think about what it is that they believe and why that they, why they believe what they say that they believe. So I think a few of these things are worth at least thinking about and considering. I know like, as I was reading through this and preparing for this, like I was challenged by some of the thoughts Um, that I heard from other people. And some of them I think are very worth considering. But if you enjoyed uh, sitting through this video, it is a bit long, go on ahead and hit like and subscribe. I hope that you enjoy it. Um, That really helps me be able to get the videos out to other people. And um, it helps um, the channel overall. So don't forget, hit that subscribe button. You can also hit the bell. So that way you'll get notifications. But I will see you next time as we begin Uh, our trip through the patriarchs because there's plenty out there about Noah. So I'll see you next time. Bye.